On this night in 1964, a young, then Cassius Clay, later to become Muhammad Ali, uh, stepped into the ring against the heavyweight champion of the world, uh, Sonny Liston, a um, a big guy, a tough guy, a um, a mean guy. Um, I I likened him to the early days of Mike Tyson. For those of you who aren't quite old enough to remember this era, yeah, or early George Foreman, you know those yeah. guys who just seemed in the moment unbeatable, just like they could, they, no one could stand up in front of them. And it was a night in which um, Ali would take the title uh, from Liston in a in one of two fights that they had, both of them controversial for uh, different reasons. Uh, Jerry Eisenberg has is uniquely qualified to talk to us on this uh, subject. Mr. Eisenberg, uh, the columnist emeritus of the Star Ledger in Newark, um, was at that fight at ringside in Miami Beach, and he joins us on the telephone. It's a uh, pleasure to have you on, Jerry. How are you? Well, I'm fine. It's a pleasure to be here because you're talking about a night when I still had hair on my head. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me take you back to that night. And, and let me start from this perspective. As you arrived in Miami Beach, um, did you have any anticipation, any way to think that what you were about to see was actually going to take place? Did you think this brash young kid, Cassius Clay, had a chance against this big bear Liston? Well, not unless you're going to let him take a gun in the ring with him. Um, <laughs> Uh, unless you believe in the tarot cards or something else, there's no way you. He was a seven to one underdog, which was a classic underlay. It should have been about thirty to one, in my opinion. And um, everybody else thought the same thing. And we all thought Liston would be heavyweight champion until he died at the age of 112. What did you What did you think of Clay, Jerry? Because he, you know, the 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 fights. He's the undefeated former Olympic gold medalist at that point, but he had had the. You know, the Doug Jones fight, which a lot of people thought, some people thought he lost. He'd had the Henry Cooper fight where he almost got knocked out. It, you know, it doesn't, it wasn't like he was making kind of a triumphant march to the heavyweight well, title. There were the reasons fight, to doubt. You know, the fight that preceded those two was with a former football player named Charlie Powell. There was nothing that distinguished him. Uh, what, what I thought of him was I really liked him very much. I, I knew him for a number of years, and I, I mean, knew him since the Olympics in '60. And I liked him very much, and he always made me laugh, and uh, I figured this was going to be the last hurrah. Uh, I was in Denver when he signed the uh, fight and uh, dragged out his bus and drove on a sunny list his front lawn and yelled, uh, come out here, I'm going to whoop you right now, come on out, come on out. And, and listen, I just moved into a semi, no, into a real exclusive neighborhood that week, and it was a tremendous embarrassment to him. And the thing was... So, uh, 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 Muhammad, as I know him, uh, got into his head, really got into his head. Um, when they were trying to make the fight, uh, Liston was in Vegas for a return match with uh, Patterson, and uh, um, Muhammad followed him around the casino, howling at him, howling at him. Sonny sat down to play blackjack, and then he, he was just got pissed off, and he turned around, and he slapped Ali in the face. And and Ali said, well, what would you do that for? I'm trying to make both of us a lot of money. What's wrong with you? And uh, then he went through the routine uh, when he got to Miami. He drove up. He took the bus, you know, the Cassius Clay special on the side of the bus. He would drive it up to, uh, uh, oh, maybe it was about 15 miles up the highway to where Listing was training. And he would sit in the crowd and he'd holler out, I'm going bear hunting. I'm going to make you beat the bear. I'm going, you're so ugly. You shouldn't be champion. I'm going to give you to a zoo. And it went on and on and on. And, you know, Liston was getting really perturbed. But Liston didn't think that the man had any skills. So, But it was working to Ali's advantage because he was building up this tension, this tension. Now comes the day of the fight, the weigh-in. In those days, we had the weigh-ins the same day uh, of the fight as they should be held. Um before television came along and needed another show. Mm -hmm. And he's there first, and he comes thundering into the arena, the Miami Convention Center, and he's wearing a jacket that says bear hunting, and he's got this African walking stick, and he's slamming it against the floor, and he's hollering again, bring out the bear, bring out the bear, bring out the bear. And um, 
um, you know, uh, we're looking at each other like there's a maniac here. Well, this thing comes out, and then he starts screaming, someone's going to die tonight, someone's going to die tonight. And Liston's looking at him, and he's really getting more and more and more. He's getting perturbed. He had no respect for Ali's um, boxing ability, and I didn't have a lot of respect for it at that time, and I'll explain to you why uh, later on. And uh, he said, well, I'm going to dispatch this guy in no time at all. And that was playing right into Ali's hands. because. And by the way, his heartbeat uh, when they took it was uh, 120 per second, which was double his normal heartbeat. And, and everybody thought that he had absolutely flipped out. Well, I began to think maybe, maybe we're being a little too quick on our judgment when his brother, then Rudolph Valentino Clay, who became Rockman Alley, uh, is going to go into the ring in his professional debut. And I hear these instructions being hollered, move your left hand, keep it up high, keep it up high, move to... And it's him. He's standing in the aisle, and he's giving his brother instructions in a very calm, forward voice, and I'm saying, hey... Maybe this guy has fooled more than Liston. Maybe this guy has fooled everybody in this arena. And there weren't many people, only 2,400. So now he comes into the ring, and when they go to the center of the ring for introductions, he's standing on his tiptoes because he's taller than Liston, and he's making himself taller yet. And Liston's looking at him, looking at him. So when the bell rings, Liston comes out of there like he's been shot out of a cannon, which is just what... Muhammad wanted. He comes there and he's throwing, throwing these wild jabs, and he meets the matador. And the matador is half matador, half Beristikov, and he keeps popping the left hands at his face. At the end of the round, Liston is thoroughly confused. In the second round, Liston settles down a little bit, gets Ali on a rope, and hits him with a ferocious left hook to the stomach, just one little bit, just below the solar, above the solar plexus, and. Um, <clears throat> Later on, uh, Ali told me, well, I, I knew I was going to have to take that because I wanted to see if I could take it. And in the third round, the fight turned, and it was all Clay, soon to be Ali. In the third round, he peppered him with jabs. He moved, he stuck, he moved, he stuck. And then he started throwing combinations. And Liston started getting a little confused. And he had a cut under one eye and a mouse coming up under the other. And in the fourth round... Um, uh, Ali was pretty much in control. The fifth round, um, this is where Ali came back after the round and said, cut off the gloves, there's something in my eyes, I'm blind, I'm blind, I'm blind. Well, what had happened, first of all, there's an illegal substance to stop cuts called Monsell. Mm -hmm. And there's, I've seen enough fights to know, like a thousand or more, if you were using Monsell to close a cut, it immediately turns black. And that's what happened on Liston's face. But the thing was, it was on Liston's gloves. Now, the question is, was it splashed on the gloves hastily when they were trying to stop the cut, or was it deliberately put there? I've spoken to the guys who were in that corner a number of times, and I can't tell you yes or no. I can't tell you what I, what happened. What I think happened will just stay with me. But the point is, it got in Ali's eye. And now the Muslims, who, not the Muslims, the nation of Islam Muslims, who are sitting at ringside, jump up. Angelo is blinded, our fighter, and blah, 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 blah. Angie takes the towel that he's wiping Ali's eyes with and wipes his own eyes to show that there's nothing on it, that he's not doing anything untoward. The bell rings, and everybody in the corner yells, stay away. And Ali did. He stayed away the entire round, jabbed a little bit, and may have won the round even. But he survived. And then when we got to the um, bell for the uh, seventh round, Liston didn't move. He had, before he sat, he spat out his mouthpiece. And Al Lee was the only one who saw it. He jumps up and he's in the middle of the ring dancing before we realize the fight is over. He is not coming out. When he said to his corner guys, that's it. They thought he was saying, that's it, I'm not taking any crap anymore, I'll knock this little bastard out. But that it wasn't it. He, that's it. He was through fighting for the night. Jerry, did you? And all hell broke. Did you, did you, when did you, at what point in that do you kind of start believing what you're seeing? You know, because it reminds me of, you know, Ali, Foreman, and Zaire, you know, different scenario, but at a certain point you go, my God, he's doing that. Or oh, I, Buster I Douglas Ali Tyson. Yeah. 
Yeah, they don't compare for me because I picked Ali to win by knockout in Zaire. But going back to this, um, in the third round, when Liston had no answer, and it was so early in the fight, I turned to the guy next to me. I do not remember who I sat next to that night. And I said, you know what? This crazy son of a bitch is winning the fight. <laughs> and after that, it was no question in my mind that he would win. I didn't understand the stuff about the blinding in his eyes. That I figured out later on with a little help from a lot of people. But, um, I, yeah, from the third round on, I decided he's going to win the fight. Because list and the same thing happened to Liston. You know, in the second fight, when they talk about the phantom punch, the phantom punch, and in my vision, that was not a phantom punch. It was again Liston tearing out to try to take his head off and missing a, roughly 30 jabs in a row. And you know, when you miss a punch, you're really off balance, mm -hmm. particularly if you go by the guy. And all Ali had to do really was tap him on his shoulder, he would have fallen down. He would have knocked him out, but he was off balance and didn't, you know, was going to go down. If you look at that film, you'll see Ali's got his right hand up around his eye. He's picking off the jabs, the ones that come close. And he sees the opening, and all he does is bring the right hand down a few inches, almost like a push, and Liston goes down. Now, when he's down... He decides he's got this maniac standing over him, screaming, get up, sucker, get up, get up. And he said, I ain't going to get up. This guy's going to kill me. And then Joe Walcott, the referee, we're now in fight two. Um, he's suddenly forgotten what comes after eight. And yeah, he's loses the count. the ring looking for nine and ten. Yeah. And listeners look at him like saying, nine, ten, sucker, nine, ten. <laughs> and what most people don't realize, by the time he turned around and found nine, ten and stopped the fight, Liston had gotten up, and those two guys were fighting. It wasn't it. When the fight was stopped. Wasn't the story, Jerry, that Nat, Nat Fleischer, the, the editor of the ring, was the guy yeah, that hollered at Jersey exactly. Joe? Nat Fleischer took his hit, and 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 probably a year later, and Sonny and I were, Sonny and I were pretty friendly. Most of these fighters, I was very friendly with, and Sonny, uh, I, when I saw him for the first time after the fight, now that's like six months later. I'm, I'm them at the old Thunderbird. Um, hotel, and I'm crossing the street, going to the star that's both of them no longer exist, and I see through the picture window, Liston's paying his breakfast bill. Well, I come in, and he comes up to me and says, hey, have you had breakfast yet? And I said, no. He said, I haven't either. Let's see. Well, I saw him pay his bill. He was so isolated and alone, he wanted to talk. So I figured if he wanted to talk, I'll ask him the real question. What happened in fight two? And he said, what happened was, not polite, he said the fight was over. Uh... And that's as close to an explanation as I was going to get. But I think what happened was he knew he couldn't beat him. You know, that fight was postponed. A lot of people don't know this. And I think Liston might have beaten him. The fight was scheduled for Boston. Sonny trained in, in, in Plymouth Rock where the Pilgrims landed. And Sonny looked like he could have lifted uh, Plymouth Rock at that point. Allie gets a hernia the night before the fight. It's called off. Liston never could get back in shape again. There was a, and, but he, that, but, and he was of kind of indeterminate yeah. age, too, wasn't he, Jerry? Like, no one really knew how old Sonny was. I'm not sure Sonny oh, knew how well, old Sonny was, was. I would say he was probably 36 going on 47. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You uh, know, I used to kid him. I used to say, you know, he was born in Arkansas, and he had 15 siblings. And when he was, he, you have to understand him a little bit. When he was a young boy, maybe 11, 12 years old, uh, the old man that was a tenant farmer comes in and says, the mule died. You're the mule. And he hitched him up to the plow and he had to pull it. And after about six months, Sonny got a bus and took off for a sister that he really didn't know, but he knew she was living in St. Louis. And that's how he found freedom. So, you know, he had a tough, tough young early life. Um, with uh, Jerry Eisenberg, the columnist emeritus of the uh, Newark Star-Ledger, who was at, of course, the... Um Cassius Clay, then Cassius Clay, Sonny Liston fight. Uh, back to um, Miami Beach just for a second here. Because you were in the ring, one of the things that I've noted um, when I've gone back and watched the video of that fight is at the conclusion of the fight, everybody in the audience is still sitting down as if they're stunned. No, there's almost no one standing up cheering, no one even standing up. 
Did you recognize that in the arena at the time? What was the feeling when Sonny didn't get up uh, to come out uh, for was it the seventh or eighth round? Seventh round. What was the he feeling was there? Come out the show. What was the feeling, Jerry, in, in the arena? Was it everybody stunned? Well, a lot of people had different. You know, he didn't give us much chance to have a feeling because, as I told you, he came dancing to the middle of the ring because he knew it was over. Then he turned and ran across the ring to where we were sitting, and he extended his left arm and he was yelling, "I pulled you! I pulled you! I pulled you!" And he kept moving his arm down the line. And uh, you know, I'm saying, hey, you know, "Little son of a bitch, he's right. He did pull me." And and um, it was amazing because he came in the ring as Cassius Clay. He left the ring halfway to being Muhammad Ali. The next day at the press conference, uh, what they used to do it the day after, he announced that he was a member of the Nation of Islam, and he did not believe in integration. He believed in separation, and he went into this thing about the black ants with the black ants, the red ants with the red ants. And I knew something about the nation going in because for a variety of reasons. And uh, the most important thing for the Nation of Islam that came out of that fight, for the first time, they had a name for the stationery, if you follow what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, the only celebrity that had joined them that people knew about was a guy by the name of uh, Ahmed Jamal, a great jazz pianist. Yes. Uh, but enough people didn't, and if you weren't into jazz, you didn't know who he was. So, Jerry, so this was a name that would go. Sorry, Jerry. Go so the, the, the push pull in emotions over those two days, because so Sonny Liston, who is. You know, for most, you know, is is kind of a uh, you know the guy who beats the beloved Floyd Patterson and is kind of a menacing figure to a lot of people in America. He's the unbeatable well, heavyweight. Well, but only in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, exactly. No, I, I acknowledge. Yeah, and so he loses to this brash guy that no one takes seriously, but who is this fresh-faced, yeah. handsome guy? He's a lot of fun. He's got this great act. He's the new oh, heavyweight. Yeah. He's the heavyweight champion of the world. And then the next morning, he says, "By the way, I'm Muhammad Ali, and the black ants go with the black ants, and I'm a member of the Nation of Islam." That's, that's a pretty wild 48 hours. Well, that didn't bother me because a lot of people uh, moved toward the Nation of Islam who subsequently left it, as did he, because he's a real Muslim, um, uh, because they were searching for something. And this is a period where they got the hippies to this, to that. Everybody seemed to be searching for something. I was searching for the, uh, the, the reason that Ali could beat Sonny Liston. And then, you know, a funny thing occurred to me about uh, maybe six, seven years later. Um, Ali was not a great fighter uh, at that point. But what happened to him is what happens to pitchers who suddenly shut out a team of sluggers and their rookies, you know, the pitcher. Um, he said, look what I did. I really did this thing. And that's when he began to become a tremendous fighter. And he confided in me, look, uh, I looked at all those films, and I decided all these guys were tremendous punchers, slow-moving. I would pattern myself after, after Ray Robertson and, and, and you know, outfoot them and out, and out, uh, outfight them with hand speed. And the thing is, if it had been the other way around, if they were all movers, then he would have stood flat-footed. He, he, he found a way to puzzle the greatest heavyweights of that era. And, you know, that was the great American era. People forget it. We talk about Jack Johnson. We talk about Joe Lewis, who I loved. We talk about Marciano. But those guys really didn't have anybody to fight. This uh, Ali stepped into an era where there was Joe Frazier. There was uh, um, George Foreman. There was Jerry Quarry, a great fighter in his own right. There was Larry Holmes. There was, you know, and it built up to Tyson. That, that whole era of heavyweights, that was the golden age forever of, of, of world heavyweights who happened to be based in America. And today you look at the heavyweights and they're all coming from uh, Estonia or Kazakhstan or whatever else, and, and, and you want to know why? Because those guys are hungry. And, and, and with the end, with good times here, that really hurt uh, the, the growth or development of, of, of the American body. One of the million-dollar questions for all of us who watched Ali over the course of his career is what would have happened 
had he not decided he would not be inducted into the um, U.S. military if his career had continued um, without the three-and-a-half-year um, separation. I- I'm sure you've thought about it. Do you have an opinion as to where we would, wh- where where in the pantheon would, would Muhammad Ali be if he'd kept going? Well, if in my, uh, you know, we all have our own measurements and standards for that pantheon. Of course. Um, I, I would have put him in the top five. I would not say he's flatly number one. But I will tell you a story you probably will be interested in because he's got a Canadian uh, punchline. Um, when he was supposed to fight Aaron Terrell and, and Mayor Daly put the fight out of Chicago, right. he came to Toronto to fight George uh, Chivalo. Yes, we know. A guy who, who a, a wonderful guy. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, I, I wish he'd been a better fighter, but a wonderful guy. Anyway, um, I went up there for the fight, and uh, it was, they, he was training in a place called Sully's. Yep, uh, Sully's Gym. Yep, Sully's yep. AC Gym. Yep, and it was a wonderful place to train because it looked like a fight gym. Yep. When you got up there, you could hardly see out of the windows; they were so dirty, which reminded me of every good fight gym I've ever been in. Well, I go there to see him about five days before the fight, and I walk up the stairs. I get in there, and there's nobody in there except the kid, maybe 17, 18, banging away in a heavy bag. And then I hear voices from the back. So I go in the back. He's laying on his stomach, and Saria, I don't know if you remember him. He was a Cuban exile, who was his masseuse. Uh, And, and, uh, or maybe the word masseur, I don't know, I never had one. And, And so he's getting a massage. And he looks up and he sees me and he says, hey, what are you doing up here? And I said, well, somebody told me there was a fight. And he looked at me and said, you know, that's no fight. I said, well, I'll tell you the truth, Mom, and why I came here. You may not like it. I came here to see if you're going to go home. A lot of able-bodied young American kids either mm, did not right. want to fight in Vietnam, uh, didn't want to fight anywhere, or on principle didn't want to fight particularly in Vietnam, went to Canada and got political asylum. So I want to see if you're going back. It was the only fight we ever had in a relationship that goes on today even. He jumped off the rubbing table, and he got in my face, and he said, that's my birthland. You think someone's going to chase me out of the place I was born? You're crazy. Now, I don't make the laws, and if the laws say I have to go to jail, then I'll go to jail if I don't, if I can't uh, uh, win it in the courts. And he meant it, and I could tell he meant it because he was pissed off at me. And um, I always had a soft spot of my heart for the Sully's AC gym because it gave me uh, a real feeling of what he was all about. That's uh, a great story. It is a um, a fascinating. It's a fascinating story. You tell it so beautifully, and even for those of us who have uh, who can remember it and have followed Ali's career and have heard stories about him, um, we, you can't get enough of it. And you've uh, you've enlightened all of us, I think, with what you've uh, shared with us tonight. Thanks very much for taking time today, Jerry. All the best to you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Anytime. Thanks, Jerry. Good good talking to you again. again.